had a number of inspiring events throughout the year, and I really look forward to today's session. Global energy transition is, of course, driven by many different factors, technological innovation, industry and entrepreneurship innovation, then, of course, the legal frameworks and different aspects of international cooperation. But one really crucial factor is often overlooked or um, underrepresented, we felt. And this is why we wanted to make it the topic of today's discussion. And that is independent and fact-driven reporting, which is so necessary for the energy transition. As journalism is, of course, key to disseminating knowledge and information on technological breakthroughs, on industrial practices, and, and so needed as a factor, constituting factor in our societies, especially in these times of fake news, spin doctoring, and so forth. So in this Women Energize Women event, female energy journalism will be the focal topic. And we've invited three, four, but one is unable to join us through because of connectivity issues, which is a big shame, but three fantastic women are here with me now to discuss this topic and share their personal experiences working in this field. I'd like to introduce them to you now, and then I'll say a couple of words in the format of our discussion before we kick things off. So first up, I'd like to welcome Claudia Solera, who is an energy journalist from Mexico. Claudia is a reporter of um, special investigations in the newspaper Excelsior and Grupo Imogen, and is part of the research team on clap food boxes in Venezuela, a research that has won the 2020 Rocher Award for Health Journalism in the digital category. <clears throat> She's also received an honorable mention in Culp in 2018, the IPYS Venezuela and Voces de America Latina Award, and is really a renowned and um, well-established um, person in this field. We're really happy that she's able to join us today. She's also authored different books and co-authored different books, including 19 Buildings, like 19 Wounds. Mm, and... Um, Thank you. You're welcome. And um, has covered investigative uh, topics in different areas, including COVID-19 pandemic, um, drug trafficking in Mexico, where she's really focused on the stories of the victims and the violence and the disappearances. So she's been busy reporting not only on the energy transition, but really a vital topics of social justice all around. It's really great to have you here today, Claudia. Thank you for this invitation. <laughs> Um, next up, I'd like to give an equally warm welcome to Milou Dix, who is a journalism network manager of the Clean Energy Wire. Milou um, yeah, um, has had first point of contact for members of the CLEF Journalism Network and develops events and other opportunities for climate and energy reporters to network and engage with one another and form, um, which I'm sure very important, bonds and networks in this field of work. Prior to joining CLEV, she was part of the data team of De Correspondent and previously also project management work for the European Journalism Centre and community management for European Press Prize. It's great to have you here with us today, Milou. Great to be here today. <laughs> And last but not least, a very warm welcome to Lisa Kretschmer, who's the head of advocacy at Reporters Without Borders in Germany. And she's been in this position since 2002, and prior to that worked as the head researcher for Reporters Without Borders in Germany as well. And in this position has implemented and supervised media transparency projects all over the world. Prior to joining Reporters Without Borders, Lisa has worked in the field of human rights and resilience, as well as in the role of media and conflict transformation, amongst others for the German Development Agency, GIZ, and also a member of German Parliament and at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Germany. It's great to have you here with us, Lisa. So a uh, quick word on the format before we dive into the discussion. We have three rounds of questions that we will go through. After each round, I would like to open the floor also for your questions and comments. You are free to do that either in the chat. This is also a way if you do not want to be part of the recording to ask your questions or comments 
or you can also open your camera and microphone and join us in the panel conversation. That's the idea. And my colleagues from BEE and GIZ will be also looking out for your comments in the chat should you need any assistance with anything. We often also post and share links. Also, if you want to do this, is shout out to all the participants who want to do some sharing amongst each other. Please feel free to also use the chat as a space to introduce each other, share relevant information and engage. So, with that, I'd like to kick off and maybe ask you, Lisa, to give just a broad overview of the importance of the topic matter that I just touched on in my introductory remarks to kick us off into the conversation. Um, so maybe you can dive a bit deeper on the question why independent journalism is such a key factor for stimulating real change and how you see the role of uh, climate and energy journalism today. So um, it's um, to start off, I, I mean, the, 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 broad, uh, the broad importance of journalism, I think I don't have to really tell you. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, it's, the, the, it's to hold people in power accountable um, and to provide uh, the ground for an informed public discourse and for um, decision making and for making an informed vote uh, during election periods. And especially in a world where we are faced um, with the challenge of addressing the harm that we are doing to our planet and to, to address the challenge to, of our own survival, um, the role of journalism is even more important than ever. Um, <clears throat> and the conditions under which, excuse me, I have to sip a, drink a sip of water. Yeah. And the conditions under which journalists can report are, of course, very different. Um, we, when we talk about um, energy journalism, it's for us closely connected to environmental journalism and to report about climate change. <coughs> Sorry, I have to. No worries, please take your time. Sorry. <laughs> in German, we say uh, a uh, frog in the throat, um, and that's what I, what I have. Um, and it's uh, when we talk about um, uh, uh, the sensitive topics just as energy and environmental journalism, we see there's still in many countries a very difficult to obtain information and uh, scientific data about environment, about climate change. And such information is really paramount um, to public interest and the coverage can really ch help to change uh, behavior and thereby uh, combat the threat of climate change. Um, and we looked into that topic the first time in 2015 as Reporters Without Borders when we uh, researched um, the threats to environmental journalists. Um, and we found that they're an extremely vulnerable um, um, group uh, within the group of journalists. Um, uh, and back then we, we found that now, back then and now in 2020, we again evaluated the numbers. We found that at least 21 media workers were killed during that, uh, during reporting about environmental issues. And that's of course only like access to information and then physical, uh, physical attacks um, as well as legal attacks are really a problem that hinder independent journalism. Um, and that also is not only uh, uh, topic that is in the global south, or, um, but also in Europe, for example. They're here, they're the, the ways of, of um, attacking journalists is a little bit more subtle by so-called gag suits. Slaps is a big issue here in, in Europe. And it's not only about the journalists themselves, but often also about their sources um, as environmental, um, <clears throat> uh, environmental activists are often as targeted as sources as the journalists themselves. Thank you. Um, and I'd love to, in the further course of the conversation, go a little bit deeper into the support structures that you provide and the way that you work with these journalists that you just touched upon now. Mm, Claudia, I'd love to invite you to share about your work next. As I said, you work in Mexico mainly, and maybe you can, from also your country perspective, give an overview of the most urgent energy transition topics that you're covering in Mexico, but also internationally. 
and um, maybe you can also share a little bit about what you're focusing um, your work on in terms of how you hope it's going to be seen. Like, where do you hope it's going to have the most impact in terms of people picking it up and um, and working with it? Okay. Please, uh, can I respond after Milo? Because I have a noise problem, like uh, one minute, please. Yeah, no problem. Yes, please, please. Yeah, I'll get right back to you and then over to you first, Milo. Um, as, I, as I assumed in my um, introduction to you, the work of journalistic networks like Clean Energy Wire, I guess, is so important to, to providing structures of solidarity to these journalists. So maybe you can share about the work in general and how, yeah, how how you are working with different journalists. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I think first of all, just reflecting on the existence of a network like Clean Energy Wire, but there is, uh, I mean, only in the field of like climate and energy journalism, environmental journalism, uh, there are multiple journalists of like networks of journalists. And I think it just sort of goes to show that there's also a shift that we've seen in the last, say, five to 10 years in journalism, where there's more coming this like collaborative mindset. Uh, journalists, journalism is forced to become more resilient. And I think this is one of the ways that the industry is doing that is by acknowledging that this like lone wolf attitude and trust me, you'll see it's still plenty in journalism, but it is decreasing, I think. And I think there is a huge strength in that. And exactly what you said, uh, Geraldine, also by the shared solidarity among journalists. So uh, I will go a little bit deeper in what we do as Clean Energy Wire. So uh, Clean Energy Wire is an organization based in Germany, in Berlin. And we uh, have sort of, I always say, we, we exist of three components. So we actually make uh, journalism ourselves. Uh, so we have four journalists working for us full time. And they cover the German and European energy transition story in all its different aspects. Then uh, we have a media programs team and we organize various opportunities for journalists in terms of events. We organize research tours, grants, conferences. And then finally, my favorite part of it is that we have a global network of climate and energy reporters. And as I said, there are multiple environmental uh, climate networks. And I think I wrote down some strengths of Clue and like the type of work that we do just to give you a bit of a sense um, of what it exactly is. So I think one strength is that we are really uh, energy oriented, whereas I think a lot of um, journalism networks, organizations, they start more from like a climate environmental perspective, which and of course, all these topics are interlinked, right? I mean, they are not, uh, uh, you cannot separate them in the end, but I think our starting point is a little bit different in that sense. And what I think is really important about this energy story is that to a certain extent, it's also the solution story um, to the uh, climate crisis, which of course, I think everyone, you know, working in this field can sometimes get really desperate of everything that's going on. And even if the solutions are there, we're not always making enough use of them. But in the end, it is really, really important to have good information about what the solutions are. Um, then I think the way we see ourselves is that we're sort of like a guide to journalists. So there is this maze of information and there's so much going on that what we really try to do is guide journalists into what are the top important topics going on. How can we support you with your coverage? And that is also where the network comes in. So as I said, we are uh, German based, but we have a global network and we really see the people in our network as like local knowledge hubs in supporting each other. So we do encourage cross-border collaborations, but I think one thing that we're really good at is uh, supporting cross-border support. So um, I don't know, we get many requests ourselves, but the idea is also that everyone in our network can connect with one another. Uh, so they have all of each other's contact details, but we also organize various events so that uh, journalists can mingle. And I would also like to say, I think a strength of Clean Energy Wire as well is that there's actually a person on the other end of the line. And that may sound really sensible, but I think we all have had experiences where sometimes emails go unanswered or there's just a standard uh, answer that you get. And what we really try to do is provide these like tailor-made types of support, types of guidance for journalists in a topic that is really, really complicated. Um, so yeah, that I think is really the strength of all these networks. And I think it's really useful for journalists, like find your tribe, find your topic, find your way of doing journalism because you have amazing 
data journalism networks, you have amazing uh, investigative networks. And then there's, I mean, I think what we do is more like this fact-based, really in-depth policy type of journalism. Um, so, and, and there's huge strength in that. And uh, yeah, I will leave it at that for now. It sounds um, fantastic. And this also being a network, I can just underline the power and the importance of networks in this area. Also, of course, especially amongst women, but also, of course, for all genders working toward the energy transition. Um, so that made a lot of sense. And I think a lot of people um, from, yeah, from who've been part of this network or maybe also yours or the media fellows also who are part of this can totally sign up to what you said if i may i think there were two points that you made super interesting just to um just to come back to before uh, moving over to claudia i hope that you can hear us well now great um you said this lone wolf attitude is decreasing and i think that's a really interesting point because assuming investigative journalism often in other sectors perhaps was something that was um, not prone to being shared. So you work on your own, you perhaps even work in competition if you're after a certain story. So can you just maybe in a few sentences expand if you see that different in this field and also this different, um, different understanding of the profession arising because of that? Yes. Um, I think there's definitely, I mean, you see a change and as I said, you see those networks, but you see more and more collaborative journalism coming up and you see, for instance, there are certain stories where there are multiple publications publishing about it one day and there are so many amazing examples of collaborative journalism cross border, but also between local journalists and uh, I think, I mean, my first ever job was at the European Press Prize, which, as the name suggests, is a prize for European journalism. And I always feel that it gives me this very rosy image of journalism because, um, I mean, these were journalists that got rewarded for their really groundbreaking investigative uh, work, which was also very often collaborative. And I think that way I really saw what journalism can be. Um, and that's also something that we try to, to uh, of course, encourage within uh, what we do at Clean Energy Wire. And I think for a really long time, journalism, as you said, was very competitive. Like you wanted to keep your scoop towards yourself. You wouldn't trust anyone else with it. And you wanted to be the one who could put out breaking news. Uh, and I do really feel that you see that changing. And I think especially for the topic of climate and energy, this is really, really important because this topic, you know, it doesn't stop at borders. The decisions that we are making in Germany, in Europe, are affecting the rest of the world. And I mean, yeah, of, of course, right now, that is also there's a, um, a light on that with COP27. Uh, but we, we should acknowledge that every day of the year and collaborate on that more and more. And I think that is also really the strength of a network is those journalists who have that type of mindset, who want to collaborate, they can find each other now. And, and that is, I think, a really uh, great way of, of furthering good energy and climate journalism. That's super interesting. Thank you so much for expanding on that. Mm, and now I'd like to move over to Claudia. Maybe you can also say how that relates to your world, if that's something that you've experienced as a journalist yourself. That would be super interesting to hear. And also share with us what the yeah, most urgent topics are that you're currently covering or looking at in Mexico, but also internationally. Okay, thank you. Um, I will have to start by explaining that Mexico climate policy has been stagnant for seven years according to Adrian Fernandez, director of Mexico Climate Initiative. Mexico committed to reduce emissions by 22% by 2030. Also, according to the Sustainable Finance Index in the Climate Finance Group for the Latin American and the Caribbean, Mexico appears in the last three places in the ranking with very low sustainable finances. Mexico allocated 15% to carbon budget compare 0 0.05 allocated sustainable finances. Makes uh, another pending issue is that only 2% of women hold technical position in the government energy sector. And precisely my job as a journalist has been to visualize this lab labor gap. In universities, the percent of Women engineering related to the energy sector in Mexico, it's only 21%. One of my strategies as a journalist is to showcase women in the energy sector and giving them a voice and document with data. For example, the lack of the toilets for women workers in government agencies because they were spaces created 
and designed only for men, and began to, uh, to push waivers to be transparent in the sector. The road is still very long for journalists to achieve a culture change, but at least we already have female leaders in the energy sector and very well documented figures and broadening the panorama and give us clear road of where to continue. The journalist format that I use the most are digital, digital news and video. Great, thank you, Claudia. That was great to hear that you feel you can also see change um, and the impact of your work. So I'm just recapping what you said. Um, if I understood correctly, that's both in terms of presenting role models and inspiring like more societal change, but also reaching people in power positions with these formats that you described. Is that correct? Yes, it's correct. It's for me. It's very important to um, to write for women in that space that never um, have to be there. It's very important to uh, listen her and see and see her in in that works that never that led us to be a star in there. It's for me. It's very important to. Um, just to write about um, different places because we have to inspire uh, to the future, to the future child, and we have to change the culture. It's for important, for example, in Latin America and Mexico, and um, my country and Latin America also is very mach machista. It's very, I, I don't know, who is the mean? I think we understand Machista in this. Yeah. <laughs> in this. And, and, and we have to start um, start less or, um, I don't know, I think that the conversation in Europe and Latin America is very different, it's very different because in Europe you are uh, more connect connected and we are, uh, I don't know, maybe you have Decades um, more, uh, um, um, uh, uh, you have to advance more than women in my in my country and in Latin America. We have to start to change um, the works, the studies. The we have to um, hear them. I don't know. Maybe we have to start. Uh, um, much, uh, more um, far away like, uh, if compared to Europe, for example. <laughs> yeah, I think um, this is always, of course, interesting is I think we're facing similar challenges, just perhaps on different scales in some ways. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, thank you for expanding on that. So just a quick reminder to the audience, we have three rounds of questions. This first round was to map out in the importance of, of everybody's work here in the room in general. The second round is going to focus on the challenges and also perhaps some of the dangers that you're finding yourselves in. I'll pause for a moment and see if there are any questions from the audience so far or any comments anybody wants to post. And I am in parallel looking into another chat because I cannot see the chat here yet. You can also open your microphone and camera. If not, then you can, of course, there'll be several other points in time where I'll be opening up the conversation. So I'll just wait for another moment. Okay, if there's nothing yet, then please keep it coming. Um, we're very open for all of your questions and comments, maybe after the next round, which is going to focus on the topic of challenges. So I'll stay with you for a moment, Claudia, um, and would like to learn from you. I'm sure there are many challenges you're encountering, and you just started naming a couple of the challenges that society is facing in uh, Mexico, but also in Latin America. So... Can you can you share a few more details in your daily work? What are the kind of challenges you face? But also, are there challenges you face, particularly being a female journalist in this sector? 
Yes, thank you. Um, during 2020, women's communication and information documented more than 250 cases of violence against women journalists in Mexico. The increase in attacks on women journalists was 50% in one year. That is, every 34 hours a journalist is attacked for carrying out her information work. Among the topics that the coverage that women in Mexico were most attacked were the COVID pandemic, feminist protests, corruption, and yes, the gender issues. For example, five years ago, I did an investigation of lack of fuels in the refineries of the most important of company in my country, Pemex, which left a loss of about $15 billion per year. And the safe way to address that issues for me, was only getting official official documents and figures, and all the record interviews because those territories and those illicit business are controlled by organized crime. While in the last 22 years, the Article 19 organization what organization was um, has documented 150 murders of journalists in Mexico possibly related to their work. I think the biggest challenge for me has been game face in corruption investigation, which was a space almost exclusively for men uh, until about two decades ago. An investigation that I did in conjunction with the Venezuelan journalist team, where the, uh, the, where the politician close to Nicolás Maduro, were involved in Mexican food businessmen. They have to leave Caracas in exile, while I was able to stay in my country and continue with my work. But the question that I want to ask, ask oneself as a journalist is, how long will I be safe to do my job? So, of course, like this is, and unfortunately, this is one country I have not had the opportunity to visit, but always assume that this is one of the hardest territories to really do the work that you're doing in. So controlled by these forces of organized crime, as you said, yes. with the different layers of complexity you're facing. Um, maybe just to get back to what Milu was saying, do you in turn see stronger solidarity and collaboration between journalists or between journalists and activists to balance out these challenges that you're facing? Um, Claudia, is that something that you're seeing with your colleagues in, in Mexico? Do you feel there's a stronger connection because of these challenges that you're facing? Um, I don't know, maybe I think that we are uh, more connected maybe in the um, last 10 years, but I think that we have to do more, more work because we don't have um, money. I think that uh, the journalists that the last years by pandemic, uh, by the um, newspaper um, out, I think that we are um, more vulnerable because we don't have research to, to be safe and we don't have the guarantee to the government to do our work. And we have, um, we have uh, connected and we have uh, that kind of, uh, of, of, uh, of um, I don't know, um, um, uh, um, con, um, conjunt, um, we have uh, uh, we can we can have to to work together, but we don't have the principle that is uh, go government guarantees and and money and we can be safe for we don't um, we have the solid the sola, the solidarity between us but it's not enough mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. be safe 
against or face to organized crime that they are huge. Uh, yeah. We are a small face. The uh, organized crime is 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 is, is very very sad. Yeah, I understand. So it's an important factor, but it does not balance out anything. No research for that. Thank you for sharing on that, Claudia. Of course, I would like to ask you, Milou and Lisa, what international networks can provide in terms of support to journalists like Claudia. So maybe, Milou, you can share first if there's any kind of specific actions that networks like Clue, sorry for very Germanly mispronouncing the name of the network earlier, um, can provide to journalists like Claudia. Yeah, so, I mean, Claudia, first, thank you for sharing your experience. Um, and I think for me, this is one of the most challenging thing of managing a global network, because the reality of being a journalist in many countries in the world is very different. And also the type of danger uh, is very different. So being a journalist in Mexico, in Turkey, in Hungary, it's really tough. And it comes with very different types uh, of threats and danger. So I think it's really, really important to acknowledge that. Um, and actually, I think my first response to your question, Geraldine, would be, I think there are really some amazing organizations and projects that are working on this, on safety of journalists and press freedom. And uh, I want to comment mostly on the Committee to Protect Journalists, obviously Reporters Without Borders, which is why I'm also really happy to have Lisa here with us today. Um, and also this project called Forbidden Stories, I don't know if you've heard of it. It is a project that was started in by journalists mostly from France, I believe, and they basically said they want to continue the stories that journalists couldn't finish either because they were killed or because they were threatened so much. Uh, they also did an environmental project back in 2018 called Green Blood, uh, and that was specifically about journalists uh, facing a lot of danger for exposing environmental damage by the mining industry. And I think that sort of projects are so, so important because as Lisa already commented on, um, journalism is here to hold the powerful accountable. And this is a way of saying, look, even if you silence the journalists, we won't be silenced and we will continue their work. So I think that is really, uh, yeah, just want to comment. I mean, there are other also, of course, organizations out there, but those are the three uh, that I always find really, really doing amazing work. Um, also, one other project I... Uh, want to quickly comment on is uh, by the European Journalism Center who started this project uh, about hate speech against journalists and sadly I think this won't be a surprise for anyone but hate speech is mostly oriented towards female journalists and then especially uh, women of color and they have they done this like data driven approach so if you're ever interested in, in, in getting more knowledge about this uh, I would definitely recommend looking that one up then sort of moving back from those organizations who are really specialized in this topic to uh, a network like Clean Energy Wire, what can we do? Um, I think it's really, really important to think about building an infrastructure within your own organization, within your own network that allows journalists to be protected. I think one way that we do that is if you sign up to our network, you can be anonymous. If you are, that means we will never publicly uh, announce your name on our social media channels or on our website but uh, your contact information will be shared with like other journalists in the network so you can connect with one another. We've also had cases in the past because I mean, a network for me is always like giving and taking, right? So it's uh, journalists do things for us and then we do things for them. But of course, if it's really a big time commitment, we also pay them for their work. And we've had in the past journalists uh, making an expert database for us. And then also journalists requesting to stay anonymous because um, this person said, look, if I'm creating a list, of experts in my country for a foreign uh, organization that could look suspicious. So I think that is like the type of way that you can build this infrastructure and that you have to keep in mind uh, these different realities. I think other things that we do, what we take really, really seriously, I think in general in Germany, but also within our organization is protecting people's data. Um, I think that's really important. You know, the amount of emails that I get where no one is BCC'd sometimes really still shocks me. Um, and then I would like to just mention two more things. Uh, what we really do is like information sharing in a trusted environment. So that also comes back to this, like being able to being anonymous, but also it's one of the reasons uh, why when we organize events, uh, we, for instance, don't record them and publish them online so that speakers can also speak in a trusted environment and they themselves can decide whether they are, want to be on the record or not. 
And uh, finally, what we've also done in the past, and this is also why I, I started off mentioning uh, these three really good organizations, is that when we were contacted by journalists who were facing threats, is that we put them in touch with organizations like, for instance, the Committee to Protect Journalists or uh, Reporters Without Borders, because, uh, yeah, as I said, they're more of an expert in this and this. But I think what is really, really important for every journalistic organization, if you work in an international field, build an infrastructure, think about these things, ask questions, because it's really important to acknowledge these different realities. Thanks, Milu. Those were so many really great points. And I just had a quick look into the staff chat in the meanwhile, because I think my colleagues will try to post some of the links of the concrete examples that you shared. That's really uh, great, because um, I think that provides our audience also with a lot of um, takeaways. Um, Michelle, I've seen you raise your hand. That's wonderful. I will bring you into the conversation just as soon as I ask Lisa in this round. So if you could just hang on one minute would be great, but very much looking forward to your question or comment. Um, maybe just quickly to complete this uh, round, Lisa, um, you, of course, with Reporters Without Borders, document um, security threats to journalists around the world. You mentioned some of the developments in the last decades, how this has changed in your introductory remarks, but maybe you can share a little bit more on how you see the um, this developing, the challenges that journalists are facing in this area, and specifically female journalists. And maybe also circling back to what you said earlier, you can share a little bit more how these slap suits work. I know a number of journalist friends of mine, even in Germany, are affected by this frequently. So yeah, maybe you can share a little bit more about that as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm also sorry to hear, Claudia, to um, on what you experience, but I'm afraid it's really a global global trend. Um, and this this uh, like reporting about environment and energy has become more and more dangerous. And <clears throat> um, it's a bad time for environmental journalism, especially because now I feel it's it's connected with the awareness for the topic. So um, that also makes governments a bit more um, anxious that uh, reporters really uh, look at the topic. Um, I now see Claudia frozen, but OK, I'm still here. OK. Um, I, and... I think she was looking very attentively <laughs> at what you were saying. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's unfortunately the trend is, is um, it becomes more dangerous. And like, uh, as, as, as you said, the slap suit, the strategic lawsuits against public participation are a big, big factor um, or a big um, yeah, obstacle for journalists to report um, no matter like on which sensitive topic. Um, and it works that way that um, powerful businesses, politicians file uh, gag suits against journalists. Really, it's a it's a global phenomenon, and we we tackle it here. We have to tackle it here in the EU as well as uh, around the world. Um, and to and those are um, abusive lawsuits. So there's not really a substance to it. Um, it just uh, has the only purpose to keep the journalists busy with um, one trial after the next hearing, after the next trial. And la just last week, I was in in uh, Serbia, for example, with one of our scholars, and she like the, the the plaintiff doesn't appear in court because he just doesn't care. He's a super powerful uh, businessman close to uh, close to Vucic, the the president, and they don't they don't even appear, but they just want to. Um, yeah, keep journalists busy so that they eventually won't report. Um, and that is something that we, um, for example, work on on a European level with, with legislative acts. So there is an initiative by on EU level to tackle uh, this, um, but it's uh, and I think it's a very, very good, good um, sign or good symbol uh, symbol to show that the EU is not a place where you can sue um, journalists. But in the end, it's w with a lot of it's uh, with a lot of uh, uh, European legislative acts. It really uh, depends on the implementation now by the member states. So it's uh, but it's a good sign also to other regions in the world that there's that there uh, is this problem that uh, the European Union acknowledges it and that there can be something done against it. Um, and yeah, um, on the how female journalists are especially targeted, um, we don't really <clears throat> 
we can't we, we don't have a, a group uh, of environmental female journalists that we specifically looked at but what we know is uh, just claudia as you said that there are certain sensitive topics um, and women are just then in a double double focus and it is gender it's uh, women's rights and it is politics like more general um, and that also uh, includes um, environmental um, environmental um, policy and what is really like shocking for me of like we probably all know that the online sphere is <laughs> quite dangerous for women and that was uh, in a in a survey that we that we published last year um that was really confirmed but what is also shocking is that the workplaces themselves are the second mo most um, dangerous um, place for women journalists to be. So that they face a lot of sexism within their own newsrooms. And that's also something that uh, that deserves more attention and, and work against. Um, and we really see also that it, it impacts um, female journalists from reporting in the end. So um, it really ends up um, in in si silencing women to report about certain topics. Um, that's really a, um, a shocking uh, finding of our study that up to 80% really either give up their social media and their, their reporting for good, or they censor themselves on specific topics. So that's really um, developing into a void on certain topics. Shocking, absolutely shocking. I mean, more expected on social media and the sort of sexist, um, avalanche of commentary that uh, female outspoken people in general get there, but all the more shocking to hear that this is still a common issue at the workplace. We would also love to ask a follow-up question, but now I'd like to give Michelle the floor first to ask her question. Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me well. Yes, yes, thanks. So, um, thank you all. I think this is a very important topic. Uh, and I wanted to ask and, and make some some comments. Um, I consume a lot of um, investigative journalism. I think that is one of the main um, promoters or or sources of information. I think information right now it's in danger, and that is like sort of like the 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 sense of my comment. Um, especially uh, like women get targeted by trolls, uh, their credibility gets uh, put in question. How do you find like not only the, the danger of the fake news, but also the danger of being like, like you, they, they use you as a target. They use you being a female as a target and they start attacking your personal life, your personal achievements or lack of thereof. Um, to to attack the credibility of the news itself, especially regarding energy transition, just uh, just transitions, cause um, and damage, and all the things that, that we know that are happening and that are important to report on. And that is one one question. And the other is, I I like writing a lot. Um, I don't particularly write uh, blogs, but I do follow a lot of bloggers. Um, and I was wondering, is like, how do you guys um, make a balance, or or how how can and how can the the public also make a balance and an informed decisions when consuming information online around bloggers? Like, I know that you guys, as journalists, can leverage the 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 blogs the, the blog sphere, uh, get more information, get your word out there. Uh, but also, again, it's a it's a fine balance. How do you actually help the people, the public, understand it, the dangers and how to actually choose good sources? Good um, that 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 doesn't necessarily have to be journalists, right? It it can be it can be like CEOs or like anybody can have a podcast these days. So that 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 type of stuff, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for those uh, comments and questions, Michelle. Let's do a round on those and we can see who wants to pick up which question. Maybe just a quick comment from me on the first topic, this strategy of personal attack to female journalists to discredit their work is, of course, something that we unfortunately see across sectors. Carol, 
uh, Kadvaladra, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing her last name, I think is a very prominent example of somebody who reported very frank, outwardly on Brexit and was consequently severely attacked. So um, who would like to uh, pick up either one of the topics first? Milou, is it something you would like to also share on from a network perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, the comment about yeah, women's personal lives being attacked. I think what is really important there is that um, when we talk about gender issues, and I honestly also think same with climate issues, I think what is really important is that you think like, what is my personal influence in this world and me from my job perspective, what I find really important, this is not an official clean energy wire policy, but more like my own policy is that, for instance, gender balance in events is so important because that way we do give women credibility about these topics, right? And I mean, especially when it gets more technical in the field of energy, uh, I see this vastly decreasing because I don't know, I've been to a, a panel about carbon contracts for difference, which is a very technical and financial topic and, and complicated. And I was looking at a panel of 13 men. Uh, and I also, I mean, I keep track of online events for Clean Energy Wire uh, about climate and energy. And uh, I published that in a blog post. Um, and also there, I mean, I see so many like, you know, still panels where, where what do we call them, manals, when there's only men in a panel. Um, so I think that is really important, like put women on the forefront and, you know, and, and then I sometimes get that. And, and, and also acknowledge that that sometimes will cost you more work. I mean, I have been in the past frustrated when I asked female speakers for panels and they would say, oh, here's my male counterpart who knows so much more. And I'd be like, no, because I actually chose you for a reason, because I've seen your expertise, I've seen the stuff that you wrote. So, uh, and of course, I mean, as you know, you shouldn't feel forced to speak in a panel if you feel uncomfortable with that. But I do think it's really important to acknowledge that if you want to have that gender balance in like the speakers that you invite, the people that you want to give a platform to, yes, it might cost you a little bit more time. Um, so I think that acknowledging that is already a really important step. Um, and in that way, yeah, as I said before, it is a way of giving women more credibility, um, but it's hard. And I think we can all acknowledge that. And then the second question, uh, I find, I think there's such an information overload these day and age that I think what is really good, think for yourself, like what is a way that I like to consume news? What is the type of news that I am interested in? And based on that, choose your platform, choose the way, I mean, do you want to get a newsletter? Do you want to get a podcast? For instance, um, I always listen to the intelligence by the economist every day. They do like this 20 minute podcast about three important topics. They really dive in deep in those 20 minutes and it's a really easy way and they do it on a global scale. And I, I like the British accent of the presenter. <laughs> um, so I think that way, that for me is a really easy way because I do a walk every day of, of just keeping updated about what is happening in the world. Uh, but as I said, you can also, you know, have a newsletter or other types of ways of, of getting the information because I think what is easily happening is that information just slips in via our social media channels, via our television that's maybe playing in the background. But it is really good to think about what are the topics that I'm interested in, that I'm passionate in. And then I think especially in like the climate and energy field, there are some specialized media as well. So if you really want to dive deeper, I would definitely recommend uh, looking into that. I wrote some of them down, uh, but there are plenty, as I said. I think one, some of that I think are really good is uh, Carbon Brief uh, and Climate Home News, which are both UK based, but write about global climate topics. You have, and I don't know if I pronounced correctly, but Greist, that's based in the US, and they do a lot about climate accountability and, and companies. And then I think uh, Mongabai is writes more about like uh, conservation and environment, and they have also different offices in in uh in asia but also in the us so i mean those are just some that i get newsletters from because i know i'm gonna get these like really good deep dives and really good uh stories and of course clean energy wire because i cannot discredit our own four amazing journalists who write about uh european and german uh, energy and climate policy thank so that you that another that chat. Yeah. a lot of more great resources shared thank you very much for that um, are there any additions to answer the question from Claudia or Lisa? Lisa, please. 
Yeah, just one add-on to, to what uh, Minut just said. You said that uh, put women on the forefront, but I would say put women on the forefront and then don't, don't leave them alone in the spotlight because that's what often happens. And I think there needs to be like a, an understanding of responsibility also within newsrooms. Um, we, we launched an initiative here among German media, which is called a code of protection. And it's um, there's and it also addresses this um, uh, gender gender perspective, but it's not only for women, but also <laughs> of course. Um, and I think that's very important that that uh, newsrooms um, feel accountable also um, for for um, their their reporters. Um, and on the on the second question on uh, on bloggers and and journalists and how to how to find your way through the channel of information. Um, we, for, we we have a very wide understanding of journalism. So for us, you don't have to be, um, uh, you have don't have to work with a big media outlet or a newsroom, but you can be a citizen journalist and really contribute to media pluralism. That's in a lot of countries that really is, is the case. What we find most important there is that being transparent about where, like your, how you are, how you are financed, um, about um, the processes that you that you the, the processes of media production more than up about the content. Um, so um, I think it's it's uh, from media literacy perspective is very um, as a user it's very important to look at those aspects to see. Um, uh, to find out who really is behind the media um, outlet or who is this blogger really. Um, and we also launched an initiative there, which is called Journalism Trust Initiative, where media outlets and, and individuals can, can get a certification. It's a, it's a Europe, European standard of high quality of journalism, so to say, and they can self-evaluate them and we, like go through a questionnaire with those processes that I just mentioned, like, do you check your sources? Do you have two sources? How is the internal validation process? Um, and I think uh, initiatives like this are, are also important to help people navigate through this information um, world. Thank you for sharing those as well. Um, and and I think mean, there's so many more aspects that we could talk about in regard to challenges. Maybe one or two more aspects before we move on to the third round. I just saw one more hand go up from Olga. No, no, I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> OK, um, but please do keep using the this is the best way I can see you. If you want to ask a question or make a comment, please keep using the raise hand sign. You're all welcome to engage in the conversation. Um, to uh, have the, the, as Claudia was describing, the government itself, or at least some entities in government, the traditional energy sector. Um, and then, of course, uh, different political forces. I hosted a discussion a week ago. I'd love to share the link with you in the chat. Maybe we can manage in a moment on how right wing entities in Germany attack climate activists and also, of course, journalists here and what extent this is really taking. Um, that's you're nodding, Lisa. I was hoping maybe of no, we're talking an in international discussion, but is that I'm, I'm guessing that is also a trend you're seeing these um, sort of attacks from right and and then also the um, yeah, the equal ways in which activists and journalists are being targeted. Could you maybe add on to that? Yeah, definitely. So um, violence against journalists in, in uh, Germany has, I think, yeah, has increased uh, by five times over the past two years, um, starting with the um, the attacks on um, on the fringes of um, um, COVID demonstration demonstrations. But before that, already Pegida, like the the right wing um, uh, uh, demonstrations. But then it again, uh, um, yeah went up a lot um, uh, during COVID and um, that's also a reason why Germany in the in our annual uh, press freedom index is not um, not labeled as good uh, any, any longer but really dropped uh, um, considerable um, ranks 
Um, and we see that, but that's actually also something that we see um, all over Europe also, which is supposed to be like, or used to be like the safest continent for journalists. Yeah, yeah, shocking and such a cause for concern. Um, I hope my colleagues can post the link to the session, which is unfortunately in German, but I think a really interesting event also in the chat. And I see Hannah's hand go up and I think she's going to share a, a comment that was made in the chat. Please, Hannah, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. I don't uh, think I can uh, unlock my camera, but at least my microphone, so this is fine. Um, I was just thinking of an issue raised by Lisa, uh, which was um, that women, women aren't only attacked by like their female, uh, their male colleagues uh, in the workplace, um, or they are as well attacked by their colleagues in the workplace. Um, so this is another aspect which I found very interesting because they can't even feel safe with their own colleagues uh, somehow. So I was um, thinking it should be important as well for their employers or the magazines they are working for to actually address this issue, to um, actually assure as well that um, they can um, present a multitude of perspectives and uh, diverse um, opinions on a matter. Um, as well to actually inform um, their peer groups, which are very diverse as well. So I was thinking if there's any actions that can be done by the employers. The employers are 80% men. So, it's, <laughs> it's, it has, you know, no, that, that, that was the other finding is that it's uh, uh, um, like in the men, especially in management positions, there are so few women. And then uh, it really depends also. But the, the, the first reaction often is that women are blamed themselves. Uh, and so it's very difficult to, you, you, I think you have to go many steps to really uh, overcome this um, this uh, level of sexism in newsrooms and it's, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I think one of the first steps would really be to, to um, design uh, the, or to design the newsrooms differently and let women come into more, more um, high up positions. Mm. Thank you. Um, before we move on, Claudia, is there anything you want to add to the conversation from your perspective? Yes, yes, I want to um, answer uh, to the another question. For me, big data and official uh, and official documents using technical and economic topics that said uh, Milo, interview expert and um, being as a professional as possible, it's um, what are very important to do my job and gain credibility. I think that it's very important to work with numbers, with data, with Excel, um, and because it's, it's, it's very important to share um, good, um, yes, um, uh, good information and we don't have to uh, and do, uh, um, we don't have to share fake news in the better way to do it is with official documents and with data and we have to work and go for that way i think that is very important and i don't know maybe when i study uh, never said me <laughs> uh, we only have to read and uh, we have to write good, but anything, uh, but uh, but nothing uh, about um, knowledge, uh, the number, the big data, the uh, documents. I think that is the first goal that we have to achieve to increase uh, our credibility and our um, social media and information. I think that I think that is the only way to do better our our job. Thank you. I think that's a very important point made. I'll just rephrase that data-based journalism can be a tool for credibility. Um, so thank you for adding that point. I have one more question on challenges before we move to the last round. Um, and this was just based on um, something you said in your first uh, remarks, Milu. I was wondering, this is not as 
difficult a challenge as the other one maybe that we've been talking about. <laughs> but we mentioned um, that it, the importance of covering the social as well as the ecological. And I can imagine that some um, journalists would gravitate more toward covering the ecological aspects, just like many conversations around climate protection, renewable energy have focused more perhaps on the ecological and business aspects of the conversation rather than the social issues in the last years. So I'm wondering if you find it a challenge to encourage people to cover the social aspects as much as the other aspects and how you're going about that at Clue. Um, I think it's an interesting question and I mean what we really do at Clean Energy Wire is we, prefer, we provide very clear cut information about policy but what our hope is, so our main target audience are actually journalists so what we hope is that we provide them with this guidance with this information and they can take that and translate that to different types of news audiences. Um, and I actually think that this social aspect is also really important. Um, I think an article that I recently read, which I think was a really, really good example of, of a social aspect of this technical policy type of story is that a journalist wrote a story about how, I mean, often when we talk about the energy transition and we say, you know, there are so many uh, green jobs coming about and this is a very social story in itself, but what she had written about was how a lot of the jobs that are being created in this renewable industry are typically jobs for men. And I think this was such a good example of a story and looking at it from a gender perspective, which was really, really needed, uh, while it was still this very like, yeah, policy type of piece. And I, I think it's really interesting what you just said, Claudia, because, and this is more of a personal thing for me, I, I agree with you that there is this idea of like a data-driven story. It's, it's my, also my type, uh, favorite type of journalism is, based on like facts and numbers and data, although I think data in itself can be really subjective as well. Um, and then together with, for instance, a personal story, because I mean, something that I've heard a lot is, is there's more need of like human interest stories. And uh, one of my COVID uh, hobbies was actually to learn Python and to go a little bit more into data and I'm still like early stages. But the question that I asked myself at one point do I want to learn this because I find it really interesting or do I also want to learn it because it gives me credibility? You know what I mean? And then and that's where I get, yeah, as I said, that's more of a personal remark for me. But I, I, I do think it was good to to ask myself that critically. And I mean, I've been part of the data team of the correspondent and there I realized what I love working with data is that it sort of gives you tools to be really creative in itself. So I am continuing with Python, but I think it's good to also sometimes ask yourself these questions because Traditionally, I think maybe that sort of journalism is seen as more typically male, but that doesn't make it better than a really, really good human interest based story or a gender lens. And, and we really need it because the climate crisis is impacting women more than it does men. So, yeah, I think it's, it's good to also have these discussions uh, with yourself or with other women as well. Absolutely. So um, if there are no other questions or comments, then I would circle into the last round that we have, which is looking at what are our hopes for the future in terms of governmental and societal support needed for the very important work that you're all doing. So coming to you first, Claudia, um, this is maybe a difficult wish looking at the present situation you are facing. However, if you could have some wishes, what types of support from government, but also international networks or other entities would you hope for? What would help you in your work and how are you looking into the future? Okay. Uh, Inside Crime has, has reported how two Juarez and Sinola cartels have shown to controlling illegal logging in the northern Mexico, especially after marijuana, low prices. Global Witness report that Latin America was the most dangerous region for environmental activists over last decade. 68% of the murders in the world occurred, occurred in the Latin America with Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico being in the most dangerous country. According to the new study, from the University of Guadalajara, illegal logins is one of the fastest growing criminal economies in Mexico. In 2019, 
the volume of the destroyed forest was equivalent to twice the area of Mexico City. Currently, I am doing research for a book on, uh, on real estate corruption and its impact on the environment. <laughs> it's very hard for me. I would like to say that my greatest concern is to, do, do, to document and expose and expose this information in the clearest way. But deep down, I, quest, I question if my country after, or the government, after making the publication known, will, will give me the guarantees to be able to continue investigating safety in my country and, my, and I answer myself, I don't know. I believe that not a single journalist will have to experience instability and that sadness with a lack of guarantees to do their job. Um, thank you. And I think, and my hope is maybe in the um, another country's network with other women, because in my country <laughs> now I can see the guarantees to do my job. And when my book was, uh, 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 when my book um, are going to be published and known in the last year, because it's uh, very delicate, that information, I don't be safe <laughs> to do it. Uh, but I think that I, I have uh, that work the last four years, and it's very important. And to do it. Uh, also, I think very um, sad <laughs> and unstable uh, because I don't know what is going to happen in the uh, in the next year. And I think that uh, that is the reality of our journalists that you have to do a very um, a very good job, but you never have the guarantees to do it. You only do it uh, because it's your duty, and this is uh, is ethical, and this is your um, goal, but not because you be strong and you have to guarantee to do it. It's it's like a uh, 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 it, it, it's instability. It is the better word to describe how uh, we feel about our um, environment and corruption information uh, to publish. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia, for the incredible work that you're doing and also your openness in sharing these yeah incredible difficult choices that you're facing regarding personal safety and the importance of sharing the work that you're doing i know these things are easily said on a panel but um if there's any way and i'm just going to volunteer all of us here which i hope is also in 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 everybody's um sense if there's any way that Lisa or Milou or myself or the colleagues from GSZ or others um, involved here can support you and what you're doing, please feel free to reach out to us as allies in this and, um, and please don't hesitate, whatever it may be. Um, yeah. Um, I know this is now very hard also to to keep uh, the conversation going because I'm sure that um, everybody's just as moved as I am by what you just said. But I would also like to invite uh, Lisa and Milou, of course, in this round to share about their uh, wishes for the future or strategies, how we can support each other even better in the work that we're doing. Um, so Lisa, maybe I can ask you to share next, like what are the kind of recommendations that reporters uh, without borders, um, yeah, give to to journalists, to governments, and how do you think that um, what what would you think are advisable strategies to go for to increase um, our support for each other? 
So maybe I start with the very practical support that we we offer journalists because that's really an important pillar of our work. Our assistance work is, for example, also to to give uh, journalists who are under in, under these tense uh, who have to work under these tense circumstances can can get scholarships and can kind of get out of of their situation for a while to to get some rest and relief and recover and think again about why are they why are they uh, yeah why do they want to be a journalist why, why do they want to report about those those important topics and and find a conclusion for themselves so that's that's really a, I think a powerful um, way to to um, strengthen mental health because it's a very it's a very heavy uh, situation under and or conditions under which journalists work in, in a lot of um, in a lot of countries in this world. Um, we also, because this might also be of interest if journalists are listening, we also do um, um, do forensic checkups on mobile and uh, digital devices. So if somebody or a journalist feels um, spied on or has the suspicion that um, he or she is surveyed, um, then we can we can check this also remotely. So if there's, uh, especially if you work investigatively, you might become a target of of businesses or governments to um, um, who use um, or which use uh, surveillance technology to to find out more about you and your sources. So this could be also of help for for investigative journalists. Um, yeah, and and as Geraldine said, if there's anything else, we are we have really a huge. Um, assistance team who does the best to find that because there's no one fits all solution for, for journalists, but to 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 um, support uh, in any way that is possible for us. And um, what I work on mostly is advocacy. So it's um, more the political level. And we don't do specific or a specific advocacy on environmental journalism or journal for journalists who specifically work on those topics, because it's a very cross-cutting issue. As I said earlier, it really touches it touches topics like access to information, source and whistleblower protection, um, advocacy for legal frameworks that safeguard independent journalists from, from surveillance, which we did here in Germany, for example, a lot, um, digital security. Um, for example, also we, we trigger um, national and international um, protection uh, mechanisms. And for example, now with Mexico, with regards to Mexico, for the first time we filed a complaint um, with the uh, UN um, in the cases of two disappeared journalists. So we have quite a toolbox to to um, support journalists. Also, which is a huge topic, is to fight impunity because there are many crimes against journalists. And, and Claudia is nodding. It's like one of the biggest problems. The nine out of ten cases still go unpunished. Um, the perpetrator, perpetrator still go unpunished. And this is really one of our more systema systematic and uh, structural approaches to to um, to decrease the violence against journalists. Because when there is no justice, then there is a it's a very fertile ground for more violence against journalists. So. Um, and then, of course, as I said, uh, mentioned earlier, we also engage, of course, in legislative processes when those topics are concerned, just as the anti-slap legislation on your, the EU level or the Digital Services Act, where we look at the question how platforms should be regulated to uh, ensure that journalism is not is not uh, yeah, um, yeah threatened by by the power of the big tech um, and um, yeah. This is, this is a little bit of our toolbox and um, really our assistance desk is open for anyone. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. And of course, I'd like to invite you, Milou, as well. How are you looking to the future? What are your wishes for, um, yeah, for different kind of support structures, maybe also internally in the network, but also looking at like what kind of partnerships or relations would be helpful for Clue and, uh, and to expand a bit on that? 
Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think it's a really interesting and good question. And also a question that, as I said, I think uh, one of the difficulties about my job is because of so many things happening. I sometimes work on different things every three weeks. So I feel that if you answer, if you ask me this question, maybe in three weeks, I'll give you a different answer. Um, and especially after talking today, I think one of our main priorities should be the protection of journalists. And Claudia, thank you for being uh, so open and vulnerable with us today. And and. Uh, yeah, extending to what Geraldine said, please get in touch if you feel that there's any way uh, that we can support you. Um, so what I think is needed for the future, I wrote down uh, both answers from like a journalism perspective within journalism and also externally. So I'll start with journalism. I think one thing that we need is like this more cross-border and collaborative mindset, also for reasons that I talked about before. I think it's really, really urgent. And especially within the climate crisis and within the energy transition, these are not topics that stop at borders. And I think when I talk about cross-border journalism, that could either be about a coal mine, you know, on the Polish border, that there was a lawsuit between the Czech Republic, Poland and Germany, uh, which I think is a really important topic to understand from these different perspectives. But it's also really about like the difference between the global south and the global north. Uh, I mean, one of the biggest topics this COP27 is, is for instance, loss and damage and uh, rich countries not keeping to their 100 billion climate finance promise. But I, what I often read in media is then just saying rich countries didn't keep to their promise. But what I sort of miss is like, what is the role of different countries, different entities in this? I think that type of information is really, really important. Um, and another thing that you often risk is this lack of understanding of different countries. And I think for instance, something that happened at COP26 final day, uh, instead of a call face out, there was talk of a call uh, face down. And I think that was like very easily blamed uh, on India and China who did play obviously a role in that. But I think if you for instance look at a country like the US, it's not that they would have ever agreed to that. But I think if you then, you know, there's I think there's still a lot of misunderstanding about, for instance, countries like India and China. And that's why it's so, so important to also work with journalists from those countries who speak the language, who understand the culture, and who follow uh, the debates on a different level that you yeah, cannot have if you're not from there. So uh, the second thing I think for climate and energy journalism, what is really important is this realization that it's such a broad beat, you know, I mean, what you see more and more is this media coming up with climate and energy desks, which I think in itself is really good. I think for a long time, what you saw is that the energy desk would fall under business and the climate desk would fall, uh, beat would fall under the, the science desk. And I think what you see now more is like really specialized reporters. But then sometimes there's a story where you're like, OK, but I don't know, there was a football field build and it was a climate disaster. But that's then put on the climate page. And I think you should also put that on the sports page. I think if you ask me the question, should every reporter in the world be a climate reporter? Then the answer is yes. And I think that is a really important realization. And you do see that sinking in more and more. Um, then I think like externally, and this is also something that Lisa has already made some comments about, but what we really need is like clear and good information. And I think this is something that a lot of institutions and governments can contribute to. And just to give one um, example, I have talked to multiple journalists who said, is there some sort of list or some sort of information of all the COP27 negotiating teams and their press contacts? And it seems like such a logical thing, right? Because really, but it's not there. And I mean, sometimes figuring out who are in the negotiating teams if you don't speak the, the language, I mean, for your own country can already be complicated, let alone if you don't speak the language or don't understand like other countries. So good and clear information is really extremely important. And then, yeah, I mean, it is such a logical answer, but funding is also really, really important. And funding coming, I mean, what you see more and more is like foundation funded journalism. And I think that's, incredible yeah becoming more and more important with um what we see this crackdown of governments against journalists on a on a global scale and then i do want to give one example of i think a really good funding example um coming from the dutch government because i'm from the netherlands myself so i follow a lot of the media debates there and in 2018 they have said that they would invest five million each year structurally uh, into investigative journalism with a focus on local journalism um, and I think this was a really good, uh, and they, 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 they would divide that money up via two different journalism funds in the country. And I think it was a really good initiative for several reasons. First of all, because it was a structural fund. Secondly, because it was divided between like these two funds who know the industry really well. Uh, there was a focus on local journalism and there was a focus on freelance journalists. And I think that, uh, for me was a really, really good example. And then, um, I do think 
my criticism sometimes of funders and I actually think funnily enough the situation in Germany is better than in other countries but a lot of funders only fund projects for one year and they always want to fund like the shiny new toy uh, instead of investing into already existing really great projects and also with one year funding especially if you have to set up a whole team it's it's what can you do in one year a year is nothing so that is also my advice for funders to do a better job in that and then maybe on a very individual level um, get a paid new subscription i would really advise it to everyone you can get really great journalism and better informed if you do it um i mean uh, yeah that's that's my final piece of hope for the future <laughs> so a call to action to the audience for everybody who feels um economically equipped enough to subscribe to a media of your choice and support your journalists thank you that was a great round of a lot of uh, very concrete things shared and a lot of moving things shared from the three of you and